So hi, um, my name is Claire and this is Jasmine. And today we are going to talk about common ground and collaborative work in the context of technology as a collaborative partner. So before we dive in, we want to start out by identifying some of the goals of our talk today. So our overarching goal is to introduce you all to some different perspectives and research areas that we think relate to your current work um, and can be considered for more inspirational purposes. Uh, so toward this end, we'll introduce complementary theoretical perspectives on cognition, uh, an in-the-head view of cognition and a distributed cognition view. We'll focus on the distributed cognition view in the context of its importance to collaborative work, uh, where we're going to try to make the case that technology can be viewed as a collaborative partner. So to give a more concrete idea of this perspective, we're going to introduce Herbs Clark and focus on that for today. And finally, we'll go ahead and provide some reasons uh, why this perspective has beneficial application to some of the projects we've talked about in here throughout the last few weeks. So I wanted to say just a few words about theoretical perspectives in general. So as a psychologist, I tend to think about different theoretical perspectives as tools in a toolbox. Um, our theoretical perspectives act as a lens um, through which we see the world. So it, they inform how we frame our problem spaces, how we identify our research questions, where we look for answers to those questions, the certain research paradigms we choose to approach those questions, um, how we form conclusions and interpretations about the outcomes of our research, and what's also important to this group, I think, is the type of technology solutions that we propose to solve those problems. So a personal example about uh, seeing things through lenses I uh, came through an experience I had with my husband. So my husband has Crohn's disease, and he, uh, he had a bowel issue, and he had to have emergency surgery. And there were some complications with his recovery, so he was in the hospital for a little bit longer than he thought. Um, so he was fortunate enough to pick up some C. diff, which gave him a personalized room, uh, but of course that's not a good thing. Um, so he ended up having three specialists that would make their rounds. He had his surgeon, who did the initial surgery, uh, his GI doctor, who was focusing on his gut area, those problems, and then he had an infectious disease doctor, who was worried about this C. diff infection that he had picked up. And all within a day, each of these doctors came separately and made their rounds. Uh, first, the surgeon came in, and she lifted up his shirt and looked at his uh, incision and said, this looks great, you should be ready to go ahead and jump up, take a shower, you'll be out of here in the next couple of days. Uh, then his GI doctor came in and said, you know, things are looking pretty good from the surgery, but we're not ready to give you a firm date, maybe four or five days, we'll see. Then the infectious disease doctor came in and said, you know what, um, your white blood count is really high still, we don't know what's going on, we can't let you go anytime soon, so we're not even gonna talk about a date. Uh, so for me, this is a, a nice demonstration of how we see things through the lens uh, that, we bring, that we bring with us. Um, and so if you have a hammer, you're going to see a lot of nails, and your uh, solution is going to uh, be that you need to hammer something in. Um, so the bigger point is that the more perspectives, and this is something that Val's done a good job of teaching her students, is the more perspectives you have, the more varied lenses you can look at a problem through, um, the more creative you can be in solving that problem. And I think that this group has done a really good job like welcoming us and bringing that to bear as well. So the idea of entertaining multiple perspectives can be extended to multiple perspectives on cognition. So these different perspectives can provide different approaches to the development of technologies. So the first perspective is one that we focused on the most in class, the cognition is in the head. This is the information processing, or mind is a machine perspective. Information comes in through the senses as it's perceived, processed into meaningful information, and then stored in long-term memory, and retrieved when needed to execute a task. This perspective has led to fruitful research on the way an individual processes information. Individual in the head cognition is extremely important However, it may not account for a lot of the variance that we observe in uh, human behavior, especially in a collaborative circumstance. Um, the second perspective is that of uh, distributed cognition. This perspective extends the cognition construct to entities and processes outside the head of the individual, which is a cognitive system. So from this perspective, cognition is distributed among people, time, and 
artifacts or technologies. So in order to understand cognition or how people think, learn, and make decisions, you must take into, you must take into account the entire system. So the distributed cognition perspective brings collaboration or collaborative work to the forefront as something that is important to cognition. Many of the projects that you have discussed in this class can be classified as collaborative work. The word collaborate is defined as work with, other, with another person or group in order to achieve or do something. And it is important in many different domains in, and includes physical and cognitive work. So an example from this class is improving physician diagnoses, recommendations, and subsequent treatment of asthma. For example, doctors do not operate in isolation. They rely on observations from multiple sources, the patients, the nurses, uh, medical records, et cetera. Now most people think of collaboration or collaborative work occurring among people. However, this definition is limited according to the distributed cognition viewpoint. And we are making the case that people and technology also collaborate to accomplish cognitive tasks. So we can extend this idea of collaborative work to technology. Uh, so the focus of much of the work in this group is not yet, at least, to completely replace the human, uh, but rather to support the human in problem solving and decision making. So this uh, implies the requirement of collaboration between humans and technology. Uh, therefore, we want to keep this in mind, uh, this interaction component when specifying requirements for building technology. Um, and this is a point uh, that I found in a paper by John Flack and his student, uh, Kyle Beheimer, uh, that I recently read. And he used um, this example of Clippy. Do you guys remember Clippy from Microsoft Word way back in the day? Yeah? So this is kind of a funny sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, characterization of Clippy, right? Um, so Clippy is saying, it looks like you're trying to work. Would you like me to bug you instead? And your options are, you can annoy me till my eyes bleed, or please go away. <laughs> now, uh, John and Kyle make the point that uh, Clippy was meticulously designed for its technical job, which was to provide information on how to write a letter, craft a resume. Uh, it was very well versed in those things. However, in fact, Microsoft uh, soft engineers spent like 25,000 hours perfecting him. Um, and he did a really good job at that. However, what they left out was this interaction piece, the collaboration between the computer user and um, himself. And as a result, he came off a little too pushy and annoyed users, so much so that people didn't use him very much, they complained about him, uh, to the point where when Microsoft released its next version of Word, one of the selling points was like, Clippy won't be there anymore. <laughs> um, so that was just a nice, um, we thought it was a nice illustration to pull in to talk about this collaborative relationship that we have um, when working with technology. Um, so how else is technology a collaborative partner? We can think about different levels of collaboration. So you collaborate directly with the tool, um, you, but you're also collaborating directly with the di designer of the tool because that designer took a lot of uh, thought, cognition, in order to make that tool. Um, so you're really, in this case, you know, collaborating with the designer of Clippy. Um, and then Claire has a really nice example of how this is a reciprocal relationship where um, the tool influences how we think about the domain, uh, but the, do the domain also influences, but we also come to bear. Uh, you mean collaborating or interacting? Is it, do you mean What same? is the difference? For me, interacting means that you are a user, but collaborating means that you have a contribution in developing the actual design. So Is there any such thing as interacting? Interaction means just. I think. The I not I think that. Hmm? Not being an active part of it in the development. Of the yeah. So do you think, so my example, um, do you think you interact with Google or you collaborate with Google? Uh, As a search engine. I agree that, I mean, if there is any kind of learning behind of my interaction, that's a personalized learning, I think. 
Okay, so <laughs> so Google influences the way that we search, right? So yeah. when we search in Google, we put in keywords only. We don't put in whole questions. Yeah. So that influenced us. Um, but we also influence Google. So Google keeps all the information on what we search, what we, um, how we search, and improves Google based on that information. So that's why I'd argue that is a collaborative. Yeah, having uh, improves your search result based on your ex personalized experience. I mean. My result is different from you. Sure, because of, right. Because of my so history. So is, is that a collaboration? Yeah. Is it? I still I call that interaction. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, maybe um, as Who's we saying? get into some of these slides, we'll also <laughs> touch on maybe more of the distinction of how we're thinking about collaboration when we talk about building common ground. Who's saying yeah. had something you want to <laughs> I think it is collaboration in terms of, uh, so uh, if you treat it as a, uh, so, so when we define collaboration as a equal contribution, probably then we have an issue. Uh, but uh, if there is an intention of each agent to do something in that interaction, for example, Google has an intention not just to give you result, but also to learn from you, whereas we have an intention not to just keyword, use keywords, but also get results. I think that is collaboration rather than just interaction. So what about working on a paper <coughs> with Amit and a couple other students? Does everyone equally put in work? And if not, then you <laughs> leave the author, right? Yes, that's what it is. 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 It doesn't have to be just Amit, anything. <laughs> Right? So if you didn't give 50% and he did it like equal shares, yeah. then you shouldn't be on that paper. Yeah. That's not collaboration. No. What if, you have, if you behave like an agent, I think it's collaboration rather than just as a Intentionally, some, yeah. yeah. So, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. So don't all artifacts have embedded in them intentionality? Somebody's intentionality. Probably. Yes. I think what he meant is more is like it's a two way difference better than it's like a one way. It, I, I don't think like the equality plays the role in the collaboration. Right? It must be the two way. It's not like 50 50 percent, but the it's always two way is collaboration. Yes. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as we said, thinking about distributed cognition lets us focus on things outside the head. And this includes the role of communication as a window to how people think when they're working in a collaborative setting. Uh, so today we're going to focus on Herb Clark's work, um, but we did want to briefly contrast uh, Herb Clark and Noam Chomsky. These two men have taken very different approaches to the analysis of language. So Herb Clark is a psycholinguistic psycholinguist at Stanford, and he is interested in how people engage in joint activity or collaborative work. So this includes how they generate a shared understanding, meaning, or common ground to support working toward a goal. He looks at communication as the basis for building, maintaining, and updating common ground. We will discuss his work and extend it to building common ground between people and technology in collaborative work. And in contrast, Noam Chomsky is interested in the syntactic properties of language. And he's a linguist. I, I yes. missed the chance cycle linguist. He, you, he's absolutely a linguist. He's a linguist. No process model uh, at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's a scientist. Yes. He's, well, yeah, you call him he's a computer like, scientist, but he's so not. But you wouldn't call him his a... titles up here. It was like yeah. psycholinguist, computer scientist, political activist. Yeah, yeah right. Awesome. <laughs> I mean... But, he, but he's, he has been quite clear about not making claims about the psychological processes that generate the, the patterns of, of language right. that, that he's described. And the, the, the nearest psycholinguist <coughs> to, to Chomsky would be Steven Pinker. And to Chomsky, um, meaning is reflected in syntax and language uh, rules. So his work is the backbone of natural language processing, and which um, many of you guys know. Why do you give an H index there? I'm confused. Oh, because we because because we want to identify for you who the really important psychologists are, and distinguish them from 
the, 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 the secondary player. So you, you, know, you can feel pretty confident if you cite Herb Clark amongst you know, any, any psychologist, they would, they would be aware of who he is. And yeah, but I mean, if, even if Noam Chomsky has uh, less uh, H index, and I don't know whether he has less H or not, <laughs> It uh, doesn't mean that he's less yeah. but, it, but it really yeah. is important, you know, as we sort of survey the landscape of psychologists, hmm. to, know, to sort of know who's who. And, and we were trying to come up with some metric that would be familiar to you, and so that's why we, we, we put that on there, just so you'd get you know, sort of a, a, a relative sense. So, and I also mentioned, I think, a while back, Roger Shepard, you know, also sort of comparable. So, so in 100 years, when somebody writes a textbook on psychology, this guy is going to show up, and so will Roger Shepard, and so will Ulrich Nicer, and you know, people like that. And then the reason that we've chosen Herb Clark's work as our focus today is based on um, its big picture goals, and we think this um, this area has a lot of potential for contributing to your approach to building technologies. And then this is um, an overview of the topics that were in the assigned paper. And then the ones in bold are the ones that we are going to cover today. So uh, getting into the paper, Clark uses the term joint activity. That's his way of talking about collaborative work. So Clark focuses specifically on joint activity among people. However, we think his perspective can be extended to understanding joint activity between people and technology. And we're going to try to use examples of both uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. Uh, so toward this end, Clark identifies three types of joint activity. So physical joint activity, informational, and a combination of physical and informational. So an example of physical joint activity would be a couple doing a waltz. Uh, so it's a physical task, and they have to coordinate their movements in order to accomplish their goal. Informational would be two or more people planning a vacation together. So this is information exchange, planning, that sort of thing. And then uh, a combination of the two might be something like working with another person to set up a, a piece of furniture, to assemble a piece of furniture. So in that case, that was um, the example that he used in his paper where people had to um, not only fit pieces together, but they had to talk about, okay, you hold this and I'll do this next and sort of collaborate that way. When you say physical, can there be a pure physical activity altogether? I, I, I don't think so. I think, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. He made these distinctions, but I think when we look in everyday life, everything is either a combination, of, most things are probably a combination of the two. Yeah, so right. uh, even if there is a coordination required, it, there should be some communication, a protocol should be there between people right. so that they can coordinate. So. Yep, I would agree with that. And of course, even physical activity, he made the point, even physical activity functions as a communication tool. Exactly. So you can point yes. and have that serve as information <coughs> exchange. Right. So another important thing uh, that we think uh, we'd like to highlight in Clark's work is that information exchange uh, is a joint activity. Um, so that, I think, is particularly important to this group because, like you're saying, it doesn't have to be physical. It can be... Uh, a button press, for example, on a piece of technology. Um, so all of this counts, and we'll talk about uh, in a little bit more detail how he defines communicative events in the next slide. Um, so another important point is that the communication medium can change, but the process of information exchange is, is still there. And so thinking about human-to-human -human, um, communications, we can, here we're face to face, but our friend is off somewhere else and he can't actually see me right now, right? Um, so you can have different mediums of communication, but we still need that information exchange. Um, so he's going to be missing out on something when I point to that right there and say something about it because he doesn't know what I'm pointing to. Um, so that is an important piece of um, Clark's work and he calls that out. Um, in terms of a hierarchy of joint activities. So he talks about two aspects of this. Um, so the first is basic joint activity. So this is like the highest level um, of abstraction there where you determine a goal. And so this could be a goal between two people or as we're trying to frame it, between you and a piece of technology. Um, so this is a high level goal that you've agreed upon and that's what you're working toward. 
And then at the lower level is what he calls these coordinating joint actions. Um, this is what people actually do to coordinate activities to get to that shared goal. Um, so, for example, if we have agreed that we're putting together this piece of furniture together, um, like the things, the, the, the conversations we have, the agreements we make, that you hold this and I'll hold this and you put this in there, that's the coordinating actions that help get us to putting that piece of furniture together. Um, another important point is that there's a whole other layer when you start collaborating with people and technology that's not there when you're doing something yourself. So that whole coordination aspect that I just talked about, if Claire and I were putting together a piece of furniture, if I was doing it by myself, I wouldn't need that whole layer there. And so um, the point is to differentiate what uh, Malone and Krauston call task work from articulation work. So task work is the work at hand, the actual task that you're doing, where articulation work is that sort of supportive coordination framework that you need in order to reach that higher level goal. And the Malone and Krauston uh, work is <coughs> very important in computer supported cooperative work, CSCW community. So going back to Clippy, Clippy uses natural language to ask, what would you like to do next? And the user responds by making a selection through a button press. So again, um, this is a communicative act. This is uh, engaging in this joint activity with Clippy, even though it's not returning it through natural language, per se. So the question then becomes, when we are working with others or with technology to achieve our agreed upon goals, how do we coordinate our actions? So according to Clark, communicative acts manage coordination, and this coordination supports the joint activity. So we communicate with technology, for example, pressing send on an email is a joint activity between you and the, um, the email. You press, when you press the send for the email, the agreed upon action is that the system will then send the email to your intended recipient. So communicative acts um, can include speech, gestures, body language, and other signals. Um, and in person-to-person -person joint activities, we have three ways to manage communicative acts. So first um, is the community co-members. So community co-members share jargon together. Um, so as computer scientists, you guys have a jargon that you guys use that we as psychologists sometimes don't understand, and vice versa. So for example, if you were to propose using, um, for example, fuzzy logic in a project, you might have to explain that a little bit more to us for us to understand. So, well, uh, a particularly uh, more or, you know organized form of uh, this thing is now building ontology, where we actually doc yes. document uh, you know this agreement, mm -hmm. right. uh, preferably using a formal language or something that has a clear mm -hmm. meaning that your other programs can understand even. Right. Yep. Yeah. And the second is uh, linguistic co-presence, so pronouns. Um, People, or we use pronouns in place of nouns, um, but we can only do that once a noun has been established in a conversation. So if I'm talking to you and saying it, um, you have to know what it is before I can start using that uh, to understand together. And then finally is physical co-presence. So if people are in the same environment, they can point to things in the surroundings and another person would be able to identify uh, that reference. So like Jasmine was saying, if I pointed to that right there and said that, our friends on Skype, would not be able to um, understand what I'm referring to, but you guys would. So um, interacting with technology can have sim similar communicative acts. So an example um, is this picture right here. So if this popped up on my computer, I would have no idea what it means. Um, by clicking OK, I have no idea what I'm agreeing to um, and what is going to happen next. So this is an example of not being a member of the community where the jargon is meaningful. Um, I'm essentially interacting with an engineer and I've hit a roadblock uh, to achieve my goal that cannot be helped with this with um, this communicative act provided by the computer and the engineer. Trust us, we also don't know what it is. Yeah, we Well, I'm, I'm sure it was meaningful to the person who right, the person. posted this yeah. right. and he thought or she thought that whoever it is that received this would be you know, we understand it, but the, but the real problem is, how many times do we do that? Really, how many times do we do that? So what is it that we're doing when we're coordinating to support our joint activity? According to Clark, we're building common ground, um, a shared understanding. So common ground um, is shared information, beliefs, and assumptions. 
and grounding is the process of taking what has been expressed and making it a part of the common ground. Um, and this is in line with Amit's concept of personalization in technology. So personalization does not only mean personality. To achieve personalization, you have to take into account uh, shared knowledge and context. The effort to build shared meaning into technology gives people the feeling that the technology understands them um, and where they're coming from, their wants, needs, everything. So an example from technology. Um, so I'm taking a flight soon on Southwest Airlines. Um, and on the, the day of the flight, I decide that I want to look up the flight status. So I type Southwest into my Google search bar. And Google immediately knows, or immediately puts up my Southwest flight and the status of the flight. Now, it, Google knows this because I received a confirmation through my Gmail that I'm taking that flight. So I have a um, common ground with Google knowing that I'm taking that flight and, that's, um, and it knows that that's what I'm looking up next. So it didn't think she was looking up uh, right. the cardinal direction southwest, or she didn't even type southwest airline, just, south, just yes. southwest. But this, but this vague, you know, polysimous term, it could have meant anything, <coughs> right. but it was grounded in the previous interactions that she had with the system. So can, it can go wrong as well, because of course have so it, many, so many interactions. Of outside. course it can, and that's... That's, I don't know if that's in your slides, but, but this is a much more interactive, responsive process when it's human to human than it is when it's human to machine. And that's a big concern for us. So there were, I think there were examples in the paper. I don't know if there's examples in, in, in your slides. Well, we talk about, so we take yeah. common, when we uh, communicate with other people, uh, we often take common ground for granted because it typically comes fairly natural uh, to us. However, when it's missing, it becomes very apparent. And some of the things that I was thinking about with this um, are idioms. So idioms are a group of words that have meaning that is not obvious uh, just from the words alone. Um, so we have two here to quit cold turkey and kick the bucket. Like, are these terms that you guys are familiar with? Yeah? So in the first one, so kick the bucket, you can see this guy, like this is what he thinks literally, and what does that even mean, right? Um, so this is kind of morbid, but we looked up the, the, the history of this, and this is when people were hanged for committing crimes and things. They, were, they stood on a bucket before they got that there. Was, yeah, that's where <laughs> kick the bucket actually comes from. So kick the bucket means die. To die. And, and that's what, right. Wow. And so this is also a nice example of how um, cognition sort of travels with us through the time. So at least in America, we don't execute this way anymore, yet it's a term that has we carried with us and it retains its meaning over time. Um, so another example was the quit cold turkey. Um, is everyone familiar with this one? This one I didn't actually know the, I, I say it, but I didn't know what it meant. So this refers to um, when someone gives up uh, an addictive substance, they get very ill and they take on the appearance of a cold turkey. So they're pale, they're cold, they're wet, they're goose bumpy, and so that's where uh, quit cold turkey comes from. And, and what, what it means is to, to stop all of a sudden. To stop all of a sudden, and that yeah. is what happens when you stop all of a sudden. Yeah. I, did, I didn't know what it means, but did not know the genesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so another example um, that I found in a book chapter by Giger Unzer, um, is an interaction between a psychiatrist and his patient. And uh, the psychiatrist is prescribing Prozac to his patients, and he is trying to inform them of the side effects. And he initially um, uses the phrase, there's a 30 to 50% chance of intimacy related issues if you use this, if you use Prozac. And he notices that patients are visibly uncomfortable about this information, but they never try to ask questions, and this is per perplexing to him. So he tries delivering this message in another way. He tells them, out of every 10 patients I prescribe Prozac to, three to five of them will have intimacy-related issues. 
With this description, people start asking questions about what they should do if they find themselves in this situation, and he find, he's perplexed, so he asks them, like, what is the difference between what I said, um, these two different ways, and what he finds out is the difference is, in the first case, patients took that to mean that in 30 to 50 percent of their intimacy encounters, something will go wrong. And so to them, there's nothing you can do then because it could happen, it could not happen. Hard to say, why would you ask questions about that, right? Um, so this is an example of looking at the patient as a collaborator and how there wasn't common ground between what the doctor thought he was conveying and uh, the message that the patient was receiving. And obviously this can have substantial impacts on whether they choose to use Prozac, um, and what you know, the doctor thinks he's doing a great job, and the patients aren't aren't on the same page. So, so overall, what does this mean for technology? So, um, Ed, you want to briefly go over what we've gone over? So, mul there are multiple ways um, to think about cognition, and technology can be seen as a collaborative partner. Um, and to have successful technology, you need to have um, common ground with the people that are going to be interacting with it. Um, and this leads to uh, new considerations for design. Um, you, cannot, you can't only focus on the functional properties of technology, um, such as what it does um, in terms of engineering requirements, um, but it has to also be usable, the outcome has to be usable for the human. Um, and people are going to adapt to the technology, like we adapt to Google, um, but um, it's important to consider how much you want their thinking to be uh, shaped by that interaction. Um, and... Can you return to the trust point? Because I think yes. you didn't, didn't mention that, actually. Um, so what does it mean to trust technology? So I think what we're saying here is that in order to trust technology, you want to know that technology understands where you're coming from. <coughs> and so if you have um, trust, you give confidence to the technology and that's rooted sort of in this common ground. If you think the technology understands what you're asking, what you're needing, um, then you're going to have trust and in turn you're going to use the product more. Do you have anything to add? No, but I think that's not necessarily the way that we think about it. We don't really, we don't really regard a trust as, as, as rooted in this common ground notion. Co common ontology is really the, the bottom line. Common ontology and common lexical items for that ontology. And by common, I mean shared, not, 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 not necessarily familiar or frequent, but just shared is the issue. And so I think also this last bullet goes back to the Krauss, Krauston and Malone, is that there's this thing that we take for granted, this, this uh, joint activity piece that we do very naturally as people, but it could be easy to leave it out of technology as we think about building it. So this articulation piece versus the task piece, the task work. I don't think nowadays it's true that we do it very naturally. For example, I get a lot of calls, uh, people calling from call centers from different places. Uh, I don't understand what exactly do they mean many times uh, because of the kind of language. Oh, usage. you mean when you, like uh, uh, helplines and things yeah, like this? For, exactly. for, yes, yeah. and this has caused a big problem, at least in the United States, so that at, uh, some some um, products advertise, you know, your helpline is staffed by, you know, American, you know, workers or something, <laughs> something like that. Be be pre precisely, yeah. because of this kind of yeah. problem. So, uh, a common word view is is definitely a problem even between human beings. Yeah. Uh, earlier, we used to interact in a very localized manner where we did not have all this global connect. So mm -hmm. yeah. that was so right. that's why we took it for granted. Uh, but I think now it's not as simple as we think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's definitely easier Like if you just surround yourself with like-minded people, right? Then, of course, I know what you're talking about. Right. And you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right?
Questioning? Questioning? Question? No. So this is our final slide. We've just tried to highlight some of the instances of projects we've heard about, um, just to briefly touch on how common ground might relate to them. Um, so the first one is technology interacts directly with people. So I've heard mentioned in here um, apps asking questions like, how are you feeling today or how are you doing today? So in order to do this, you need a knowledge base of the person um, in order to interpret their response to know that they're actually telling you how they're feeling today in terms of like their asthma and not like something else. <laughs> So that's a very vague question, right? And the and the proper answer to that question mm -hmm. is very situated yeah. and very context yeah. dependent. So it, it can be as relative as better, or it can be another set of symptoms yeah. from where you need to infer whether it is actually better than the previous <coughs> state or not. Or it could be my crazy mother who go, who starts talking about her feet with the you know with the doctor who worries about her I don't know something else orthopedic person or something. Yeah. So, so you, that's, that, that looks like a very innocent question, yeah. but it really takes a lot of knowledge True. to respond to it correctly. True. And to interpret that response. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I think, you know, you pr I, 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 I know something about you guys. I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, I develop technology for professionals, and I'm not going to have this problem because I'm going to be developing technology for doctors, and I know how they think. Are you sure about that? Yeah. <laughs> no, at least I don't make that clear. Yeah. I think you, you have to be really careful. I know on hazard seas we've worried about this a lot. You know, mm -hmm. how, how is it that the emergency responders are thinking? And, and, and what do what kind of information do we need to provide for them? And what's the ontology yeah. and the lexicon that would be appropriate for them? Yeah. So the same issues arise. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a lay person or a professional person. They probably have, as these guys were saying, a different lens on the world than we do as, as, as developers. And we have to worry about that all the time. So the second point might be a jargon flaw on my part. <laughs> um, this is a, something that Val and Hussein spoke about a few weeks back. This is the idea that if you're trying to pull data from a bunch of different sources, do you know what I'm talking about, Val? Yeah. I think you can articulate this. Well, I, I, I don't remember this title, but I, I know I was thinking today, because I read, I looked a little bit at Amit's article on ro RoboBrain. Did you guys have? A, did you guys look at that? And um, and I was looking at the modification of the knowledge base to add. I don't remember if we were adding cups or mugs or something. We were adding something to the knowledge base, and and I thought computer scientists think of the um, accrual of knowledge as monotonic. You just keep adding pieces in until you get enough. And that idea has been abandoned in psychology for 30 years. Um, and it, and the, the reason we abandoned it is when we studied human learning and we started developing computer-assisted instruction, you know, those, those um, interactive tutoring devices, what we discovered, we started out with this model that students are just like mini-experts and you just need to add the little building blocks in and then you'll finally get a real expert. And what we discovered is that the students had outright misconceptions. And in other words, fundamentally different ontologies. And so in order to make the learning work, you had to debug the misconception, fix the ontology, and, and rebuild it. And, and the little glance that I made at the robo-brain um, argument didn't seem to recognize that property of at least um, knowledge building in, in humans. And so that, that's really the, the, the point that, that, that I would make about this, is that a, a human user is always going to be worried about whether you have comparable on, ontologies and not whether 
And it's not going to be a question of just adding a piece in. It's going to be a question of actually needing to restructure the knowledge so that you have um, a collaboration. Okay, so then we were thinking about um, grounding abstractions as well. So is asthma well controlled, moderately controlled, or poorly controlled? Do, do these things mean the same thing to the technology, the patient, and the doctor? I think that's an important consideration um, based on Clark's work. Um, and then in harassment and emergency response tweets, you know, here we're looking at language, so there's a direct connection. So you can imagine seeing a message like the one in this first bullet, and um, propositionally, the content looks harassing, but we can all imagine a situation where maybe someone was joking when they made this statement. And so, you know, most of the time, actually. Yeah. <laughs> most of the time, that's what's going on. Yeah. So we have some references. So we thought this was a nice um, article to cover because it seems like these are things you guys are already thinking about. And so just to give you like uh, a body of work to, to dig into if you seek inspiration in it. Can you elaborate more on the previous slide, this grounding abstraction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you said based on the clock's work. So what is his point on this? So his point would be that you need to make sure that when when the tool says that your asthma is well controlled. So it goes back to the uh, the example of the doctor prescribing Prozac is kind of analogous to this as I see it. Um, so when the doctor was providing the information, the patient it didn't mean the same thing to the patient as it meant to the doctor. So, so this abstraction that you're ending up with from collecting all this data and determining whether the asthma is well controlled, moderately controlled, or poorly controlled, what does that mean to all parties involved? So is let's, it grounded? let's say you were doing, I know they don't do this, but let's just say that you were doing um, an asthma uh, assessment based on O2 saturation, just you know what the oxygen levels were in the blood. <coughs> and let's say it was 99. Okay, and in fact, I, I actually am an, uh, an asthma patient like this. Um, so, so from the statistics and from some kind of computational perspective, everything looks just great. But the patient says, <laughs> this patient in particular, I can't speak as many words in one breath as I would like to. From my perspective, from the criteria that I use, I'm not well controlled. From the machine's perspective, it is well controlled. Mm -hmm. And you would want, you know, you, you need to make sure if, if the machine comes back or the doctor comes back and says this is well controlled, and I can't say as many words in one breath as I want to say, what am I going to think about that doctor and that machine? So what we should care? We should care about the doctor's point of view and machine points of view or patients care. About. What do you think? I think uh, knowledge base, which is doctor, and then <laughs> So the hell with me that I can't that I can't say as many. You don't care. It would be too subjective on this. So, yeah. so, so, you really think so, that? so the real thing is uh, that the doctors really uh, know that most diseases cannot be fully solved, and they are trying to achieve, uh, you know, the state where patient feels good enough. Okay. So it is not from a clinical point of view. It is that that you, the results are not you know really that you're trying to achieve often are not from the you know, clinical point of view. Some of the diseases are either um, uh, uh, chronic, others are not curable. And uh, you would, for example, say, patient will say, well, is, is, so doctor will say, is the patient comfortable? Or uh, because you try to uh, do over intervention, and the, those drugs will have side effects. So really, you go from one thing that is bothering you to another thing that is bothering you. Doctor knows that. So really, it's not about re fully you know, curing anything or getting any ideal clinical state, per se. And um, really, two patients uh, have a, a different, let's say, ability to bear pain. Um, and hence, um, uh, and pain medications have side effect. And hence, the idea is to give just enough uh, pain medication, uh, low you give less side effect, but enough in that patient feels good about it, or you know, doesn't have you know, pain as the big 
uh, the thing that really bothers him the most. So uh, that's it is very subjective and it is very personalized. This is where the personalization comes in, and we need to understand. That's why in our asthma application, we really not that we do it now, but what we are where we are like to go is that we would. Um, uh, um, when we ask patient, how do you feel today? We would have um, exhaled nitric oxide that tells you how good is your lung function. But um, we would uh, not necessarily, you know, uh, it's not the deciding factor. It is uh, how the patient feels that we have to factor in. How well will factor in it? See, doctor, a human, uh, would be applying a very uh, subjective criteria and, you know, you're looking at the patient, you're looking at expressions and other things like that. You're looking at body language. Our application won't have that. So what do we do and how do we make, uh, uh, you know, judgment that uh, similar to what doctor does? And we don't, you know, while we know we can't make as good a judgment, how well can we go there, right? Or at least know the disparity between what the... Uh, measurable uh, functions tell you uh, versus what patient tells you, right? And then, uh, you know, very often, I mean, uh, uh, clinical doctors don't know. If a patient says, I feel very good to go to work today, well, pa the many times patient, doctor would say, well, then go to the work. I mean, you know, I'm <laughs> going to keep you home, right? Uh, only in uh, minority case where doctor knows that, uh, you know, in large number of cases there is a significant, uh, you know, bad outcome if you take liberty too fast or exertion, take exertion too, far, too early, then they will say no or they will, you know, but this is how it is. Typically, a patient, how he feels or she feels, decides kind of, for example, post-operative, uh, you know, decisions and um, not the other one. A patient like me would want to leave for home as soon as possible, right, and regardless of what they say. So, you know. And that's so, what I hope they do. Look I don't at. think we throw up our hands and say, so, so the technology is useless. I think the point is that, that the consumers of the technology, whether they're professionals or, or patients, need to understand the dimensions, the parameters upon which the decisions were made so that you can say, okay, you know, I know that you know, lung functions and oxygen saturation look really good, but hey, I can't say as many words as I, as, or this patient can't say as many words as he or she would like to. And by the way, this patient is a, is a professor and so needs to, needs to be able to say a lot of words, etc. Mm -hmm. So you, you take all of those things into account mm -hmm. um, when you, as a consumer of, of the technology. And our, our big concern is that the foundations of the decision making are not sufficiently transparent to allow a consumer to be a, a wise consumer. In, in, in that technology. Not, we don't want you to throw it away, we just want to make it sufficiently transparent so that the logic is clear. Oh, there it is. I thought uh, you this is asked when I wanted Tanvi and I said, Tanvi, where are you? And she said, I'm here. I have a question about that. <laughs> the, uh, how would you validate your system? You would have to compare it with the clinical diagnosis though, right? I mean, I, it's, I, uh, I mean, I, in that I, sense, I'm in agreement. Or would you wait for the patient response to the clinical diagnosis and then evaluate with that? You know, I, I, I don't think well, I'm in any worse situation than you are with, re, with respect to the validation right. question, <laughs> right? Because the question is, what's the gold standard? Right, right. Right? Exactly. So, I, you know, I, I, I refuse to answer on the grounds that it may incriminate me. I mean, there's really, <laughs> I, there, there, I'm not in any, any worse situation than you are in. But what I, but what I would say is that patient compliance is a huge, maybe I should say huge, huge problem. And so making the reasoning and the recommendations transparent to patients, I think is enormously important, um, whether it's asthma or, 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 anything, or, or anything else. common ground has in some way context uh, modelized? Do you have the notion of context inside? Yeah, oh, so yeah. it's very context yeah. dependent for sure. Yeah. So like we've talked about pointing here, yes. you know, so this that can only be done in this context right here. So this is a very constrained context to understand that and have common ground um, in that way. 
But it's worse okay. than that. Can you merge also, uh, I mean, differences between languages, between, between the cultural issues? Sure, but it's, yeah. it's like, it's even worse than, than that. It's that the way in which I can identify uh, a chair is a function of the other chairs that are in, this, in, in our current field of view. So I can't be in this room and say, the black chair. Everybody would go, well, there's 30 of them, right? And I can't say, uh, the, I, can't, I can't say anything that's in common to all of these chairs. I can't say, uh, the chair in front of me. You st that still wouldn't be sufficient, right? So th there's, I'm terribly worried about this, it's particularly for um, hazard seas, that the language that we choose is a function of the discrimination that is required for the current context. And this is a big issue in, in location identification, which, we, which we've been talking about in, in Hazard Seas. And then, you know, and then of course you have all of the cultural and, you know, language issues and whatever for, for distinctions that are apparent in particular languages and, and cultures with one word versus require many and yes. And so I think, so one of the things that they really didn't get into here, and I don't even remember if it's actually in the in the article or, or in this particular article or not, is the the real time nature of adjusting, constantly adjusting and confirming that you have common ground, that you that that you agree. And st I'm looking at Tommy right now, and she's doing it right now. She's she's shaking her head. We do this all the time, right? We we constantly monitor each other to make sure that the other person is understanding what we're saying. And if I looked out at you guys and I saw this sea of blank faces, I would be thinking I'm not being clear, um, you know, they have no idea what I'm talking about, and, then, and I would adjust. And so there's, this is something that we really need to be thinking about in terms of what our technology can do to, to monitor the persistence of common ground and repair common ground when, it, when it's missing. That's something that people do. So we, I think the point of all this is that as we, as we work on extending our, our models for what our technology ought to be doing, we'd like you to be considering this sort of collaborative, distributed perspective on, on how to um, develop the technology in addition to the sort of the more individual cognitive functions that you guys are, are obviously, you know, really concerned about. And just one fact, in, in the example you have given for writing paper, uh, okay, yeah, by using uh, Google Doc or whatever you said, for, for me it's not that you collaborate <coughs> with the tool, it is you collaborate with other people by using that tool. I mean, I, for me it's very difficult to understand this, that you collaborate with the tool, I mean, in the example with searching, yeah, that's what uh, I'm it's uh, co wait. collaboration for me. It's um, when you collaborate to achieve a common goal. There, it was uh, okay. I, I sorry, what was the example? I search in Google or something. So for me, I'm interested in the result. But Google has another interest behind this. It's not. So you're about. saying that they don't have shared goals? Yes. Yeah. I think they have, uh, for example, giving good results. So generating good results is a problem. No, it has, he has other goals behind them. Yeah, there are, but uh, all collaborations will have some common goals. Exactly. And, uh, a lot of distributed okay. goals. Yeah. So it's not always one common goal. Yes. Yeah. I, I, th I think that's that's true. There's a, uh, there's just overlapping goals. But I would say, and the, the writing example is not, is, is not an incidental example. That's actually the thing that Claudia and I are, 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 are working on together. But I would say there's always a third participant here, and that is the designer of Google Doc or, or whatever. And we've come across this. Google Doc made the assumption that the size of the group was going to be 10-ish. Right? Okay, so that's a constraint on on how you're going to interact and, 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 and how you're going to collaborate. So that that designer and that constraint is, I would say, is present. 
in, in the collaboration. Yeah, but it's collaboration between people, not between... But there's a designer. User and Google. There's a designer. Yeah. And designer. you guys are the designer. <laughs> so my, my question is, that, do you collaborate with the designer or not? You collaborate, as she said, with others. Well, I happen, I happen to be collaborating with a designer, but that's a rather unique situation. <laughs> but I, I would say we all, we all are. Your, your, your activities are always shaped by the intentionality of the people who designed the artifacts. And that includes all artifacts, even that cup. You're collaborating with a whole history of, of you know, how we eat and prepare food and, and distribute food and whatever. It's implicit in, in the interaction. You don't like that way. I don't like interaction. I don't think any anthropologist would say that. No anthropologist would say that. How can I collaborate for the next generation of the cup if I'm not any designer? Well, you're not good. You, you personally are not going to des design the next generation of the cup, but that design is shaping how you eat. But how that's you, a different story. Right? It's somebody coming from you know from the past who's decided that this is the right that you know you need that kind of handle and that size and for the for the food that you're going to eat. What about purchasing the cup? You're saying this is the type of cup you want. Somewhere uh, okay. That way. So yeah. what what is the next? <laughs> I didn't hear this argument. <laughs> okay. We're done? Yes. All right. Good. I'm glad in this conversation, I know, topics related to our projects also came up. So, yeah. Good. Thanks.